Hello, I'm Pastor Bruce Anderson of New Hope United Methodist Church, formerly First United Methodist Church of West Chicago and Winfield Community United Methodist Church. We're glad you're able to join us for the online service this morning. We will be having our stewardship series from May 21st to June 4th, and the topic will be Flying the W for Winfield, West Chicago, Warrenville, and Wheaton. And we will be looking at Word, Water, and Witness. So I hope that you'll step up and help support your church.
welcome to our time of prayer together. I would lift up all those who continue suffering around the world from violence and oppression. The war in Ukraine, the oppression in many other places, and the ongoing mass shootings here in the United States. Let us keep all of them in our prayers. Let's also remember the uh, Christians in India who are facing persecution there as there is um, religious oppression going on anew there these days. Let us remember all those who hurt and are hurting and lift them up to God in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, you know the thoughts of our heart before we even speak them, yet you long for us to come to you and commune in prayer so that we might spend time together. And I, I pray for all those who are hurting in mind, body, and spirit, that you would send your healing spirit upon them and return them to the health and wholeness that you desire for all of your children. Be with those in the healing professions and help them to do their best to help your children. Also, be with those around the world who suffer under violence and oppression, that they may know your peace that passes all understanding until your creation itself can be at peace. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
this morning's reading, we hear Jesus refer to himself as both the Good Shepherd and the gate for the sheep. He watches over and cares for his sheep. He is willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And he says that he is the gate that lets the sheep come and go from the fold. So he is also the guardian of their safety. He also says that he has sheep that are not of this fold, that he must gather in so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. Is there more to these metaphors that we do not understand from our modern Western perspective? George Adam Smith, the 19th century biblical scholar, tells of traveling one day in the Holy Land and coming across a shepherd and his sheep. He entered into conversation with him, and the man showed him the fold into which the sheep were led at night. It consisted of four walls with an open way in. Smith asked him, is this where they go at night? Yes, said the shepherd, and when they are in there, they are perfectly safe. But there's no door, said Smith. I am the door, said the shepherd. Now, he was not a Christian man and wasn't speaking in the language of the New Testament. He was speaking from an Arab shepherd's point of view. Smith looked at him and asked, What do you mean you are the door? When the light has gone, said the shepherd, and all the sheep are inside, I lie in that open space, and no sheep ever goes out but across my body, and no wolf comes in unless he crosses my body. I am the door. Could this be what Jesus was referring to when he said that he was the gate? The Arab shepherd slept in the opening of the sheepfold to keep them safe. He guarded them with his body and his life. He had that much love for his flock. Well, I don't know about you, but after a hard day's work, I would want to go home and rest relax, and eat. But this shepherd was on the job 24-7. Doesn't that sound a lot like Jesus, our shepherd? Jesus is available to us 24-7 through prayer, and he has said that he is the way through which we come to the Father. The Holy Spirit is also with us 24-7, whether we realize it or not. We know that Jesus is the good shepherd who laid down his life for his flock as he went to the cross for us so that we could receive the gift of the Spirit. As Jesus tells us later in John, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. In our reading, Jesus tells us, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. It's no wonder that those listening to him did not understand what he was saying, because there was nothing to compare it with. How could anyone lay down their life of their own accord or not? And take it up again. From their perspective, that would not make any sense. First, because it had never happened before, and second, human beings can't do it. So no one thought that such a thing was possible. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus told his disciples in another context, for mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. And then he proved it by laying down his life in order to take it up again. Nobody else has this power, only God alone. For with God, all things are possible. Even with our clear modern historical perspective, some may have a difficult time truly believing it today. For we live in a time of science where Miracles just do not happen, or at least we rarely choose to recognize them if they do. But over 2,000 years of Christian history tells us that it's true, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and then after three days took it back up again, 
and the world has never been the same. The disciples were certainly changed. They went from a group of frightened followers of a disgraced and crucified teacher to a band of bold witnesses for Christ. They didn't care what the Romans or priests had to say about it, or them. They simply had to witness to Jesus' resurrection. There was no stopping them and no holding them back, no matter what the personal cost to them. For like their Lord and teacher, they were now willing to lay down their lives to bring more sheep into Jesus' fold. They had to go to the ends of the earth to spread the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and God's deliverance of humanity from sin and death. Their lives meant little to them in the face of this new reality. Everything had changed, but especially them. Jesus said, I had sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And he sent his disciples out to gather everyone into his fold so they would recognize his words and follow the voice of the good shepherd. Now, some people have said that Jesus' statement later in John, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father except by me, limits God's grace and access to heaven to Christians, that those who do not believe in Christ in this life are damned. But I do not understand it that way. While the saying is true, no one comes to the Father except through me. Who did Jesus not die to redeem? Jesus is still the Good Shepherd, who has sheep that are not of this fold, that still must be brought in so there will be one flock and one shepherd. The whole arc of the Bible is to greater and greater inclusivity, bringing in more and more diverse people. Jesus did not want to limit people's access to God. He wanted to expand it. Jesus offered unlimited love and forgiveness so that even those who did not believe in life and show up to the gate of Christ's heavenly fold and realize, oh wow, was I wrong about Jesus and Christianity? I believe they can repent and be accepted into the flock of our shepherd at that time. I believe that separation from God is voluntary. I'm sure that we all know people who would walk right up to God given the chance, spit in God's eye, and tell him exactly what he can do with his heaven. And God would respond, Thy will be done. Because God's love is not coercive and does not require all of us to believe the same thing. That is why we have free will and are allowed to use and abuse it as we will. If we do not want to be a part of the flock, the shepherd will allow us to wander off on our own and away from the heavenly fold. But I don't think that the good shepherd ever stops looking for the strays. I believe there's always the chance to repent and be saved, mostly from ourselves. We have the Good Shepherd who seeks the least, the last, and the lost, and will not stop until all have heard his voice and been brought into his fold. Middle Eastern shepherds are not like American shepherds. There they walk in front of the flock, and the flock follows them. Here the shepherd walks or rides behind the flock and drives them where he wants them to go, forcing them to follow his will for them. Not so with Jesus. He calls his flock by name and they follow him willingly, of their own accord or not. Thanks be to God who sent our good shepherd to show us the way, the truth, and God's light, that all people might hear his voice, and be brought willingly into his loving, inclusive fold. Amen.
Our church is sustained through this wilderness time by your faithful generosity. You can continue to send your offerings by mail, or for more information about setting up an electronic funds transfer, contact Roberta Kent or Pastor Odney.
Now, we, as we go into the world this week, may we follow the example of Christ, our Good Shepherd, living as he showed us how to do through his life, death, and resurrection. And may we spread the good news of Jesus Christ to all those we meet. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen.